ceremony this morning. Reverend Muse is the pastor of the First Parish Federated Church right here in South Carolina. She and her church have been long friends and neighbors to Berwick Academy. Her parish was founded in 1702 and therefore enjoys an even longer history than we do. More importantly, Reverend Muse is one of the most caring and committed people that we can claim as a citizen of South Berwick. It's an honor to have her with us today and I now invite Reverend Muse to the podium to offer the invocation. And it is always an honor to be here with you as well. Let us pray. As we begin our ceremony today, Creator, we gather within the love and care of all people who have brought these students to this moment on our family. We trust in your loving care. Let us imagine what you shall do with all the talent and intelligence 
Please be seated. President Tay, members of the boards of trustees, faculty, staff, parents, grandparents, friends, it's my pleasure to welcome you to Berwick Academy's 221st commencement exercises, where I have the honor of presenting to you the class of 2012. Now, given that the Schneider family happens to be waiting with bated breath as to when girl number three might arrive, it is a particular thrill and relief to be here today. I had worried that I might be Skyping in from Portsmouth Hospital or calling upon my assistant head of school to don this medal and read my speech. Rest assured, there's no one in our audience today more joyous than Mrs. Briggs. <laughs> but separate from my own baggage this morning, our graduates will surely be glad to know that, on account of my predicament, I have a particular investment in moving today's ceremony along swiftly. So while I kindly ask all of you to turn off your cell phones as you savor these profound comments, I will assure you that my iPhone needs to remain on. More importantly, as I look at our graduates, this group of 65 individuals, there are an infinite number of moments that comprise their collective story. Successes, failures, moments of humor, and examples of resiliency, all of which begin to swirl about my memory as I stand before you on this exquisite Seacoast morning framed by a fully restored and equally glorious Fog Memorial Building. And this reminds me there will be three parts to my comments today. After beginning with a summary of the achievements of your class, I've decided to focus on a theme and a symbol. The theme will be the nature of memory itself, which feels appropriate, given our graduates today will remember precious little about what is actually said on this graduation day. Wouldn't we all agree? <coughs> and the symbol I've chosen to link with your special day will be none other than my favorite animal, the turtle. You could ask my daughters about my turtle obsession. Today, this ultimate mystery of irrelevant Mr. Schneider minutia will be revealed to you in full. Let me start by offering what I will remember about you as a group. I'll remember that you began this year wondering what your identity might be, partially because you worried about measuring up to other classes, but perhaps more importantly, because you cared about your legacy. I'll remember the staggering impression of your academic achievements in considering your college placement results and plentiful academic awards. You brought forth causes and ideas for us to ponder in critical ways. Issues of gender, equality, social justice, service, and compassion strike me as chief among the list. I'll remember that one of you came to my office to interview me for an article. Probably, like most heads of school, any interview with a student reporter got my wheels turning about what I'd done wrong or what decision was coming under scrutiny. But this person, who I believe is unafraid to speak his mind, chose to end that exchange with his thoughts about how I had done important work to make Berwick Academy a better place during his tenure here. Now granted, this was well before I made any of my thrilling changes to cell phone policies in the upper school this spring. But his candor that day struck, stuck with me, and it will be with me long after the members of 2012, the class of 2012, leave us, because that is a cherished memory of my own. Athletically, I'll remember the incredible dominance of our three-peat golf team, the varsity establishment of field hockey, whose record went beyond my dreams. I'll remember the beginning of a turnaround for our girls' varsity programs in general, starting with signs of brilliance from soccer and continued excellence by hockey and lacrosse. Our winter season was the best I've experienced in my time here, highlighted by a NEPSAC appearance for boys basketball and the girls varsity ice hockey team three-peating as EIL champions. I opened the Boston Globe in March to see four Berwick students named as Globe All-Scholastic League MVPs during the winter. In fact, we had six of those before the year was over. 
Spring found us with a girls lacrosse program in the A bracket for the first time in recent memory and a baseball team that simply won our hearts. They thwarted Pingree in the bottom of the seventh in the semifinals before going on to capture our first NEPSAC title on the diamond in many, many years. Not to mention putting out a music video that has now officially gone viral. <laughs> what will I remember about your class artistically? I'll remember Damn Yankees as the strongest musical production during my five years on account of the acting, the vocal performances, the dancing. I'll remember the sophistication and maturity of your Shakespearean vision in the fall as well as your dance extravaganza this spring. I'll remember the feeling in my stomach when some of you called me up on stage to don a red wig and become Ophelia in your one-act plays. I'm still recovering from that one. I'll remember a series of concerts this spring that were inspiring in their quality as well as in their cross-divisional purpose. Your visual artists continued placing Berwick on the national map in terms of competitions, and your imagery was inspiring. As a group, you found a way for your art to become a vehicle of expression as to what mattered most to you, and in turn, to all of us. When I consider issues of service, inclusion, and diversity, your group led this community in remarkable ways. Whether it was a compelling speech about Veterans Day, a GSA assembly that explored gender stereotypes, a SWAT group that was committed to strengthening community, what was most obvious to your head of school was simply that you cared. This year, for whatever reason, I found myself awash in reading literature about the nature of memory. The result was a realization of the imperfect links between memory, experience, and truth. In a literal way, your experience at Berwick will be, can ultimately only be, what you remember it to be. And I'm going to urge each of you to consider your own role in shaping and nurturing those memories in the years to come. I begin with a quote from Julian Barnes' book, Nothing to be Frightened of. He points out the reality that when you are adults, you will remember a very different Berwick Academy than the one you think you remember right now. He states, memory in childhood, at least as I remember it, is rarely a problem. Not just because of the briefer time span between the event and its evocation, but because of the nature of memories then. They appear to the young brain as exact simulacra, rather than processed and colored inversions of what has happened. Adulthood brings approximation, fluidity, and doubt. And we keep the doubt at bay by retelling that familiar story, pretending that the solidity of narrative is a proof of truth. But the child or adolescent rarely doubts the veracity and precision of the bright, lucid chunks of the past it possesses and celebrates. Let me start by saying that I believe something real is happening to each of you today. And while some will clearly be more outward regarding the emotion connected with graduating and saying goodbye to your teachers, your friends, and your school, I think that each of you feels something deep down somewhere. And while I'm not here to make it something bigger than it is, I do urge you to consider the veracity and lucidity that emotion. And as the years pass, this emotion will inevitably become processed and colored in to the point that you may find it hard to believe this was even such a big deal. Barnes would argue that the clarity of memory you see and feel today will likely be more true than the one you'll polish up or allow to dull 20 or 30 years from now. I ask you to consider keeping it polished. Take ownership of this memory's shape as well as its lasting luster. I first read about memory as a freshman in college, actually. In my interdisciplinary freshman seminar, one of the most impactful titles for me was Speak Memory by Vladimir Nabokov. In my first, if my first request was to steward your individual memories of Berwick, then my second is to help you see the obligation to share your memories with each other over time. With your peers, with your Berwick teachers, with your parents, your siblings, 
perhaps even your own children someday. One of Nabokov's quotes about memory that speaks to this dynamic is beautiful in its metaphoric simplicity. The spiral is a spiritualized circle. In spiral form, the circle uncoiled has ceased to be vicious. It has been set free. As a clap, let the spiral of your storytelling, laughter, and shared dreams reinforce the sense of community that you built during your time here. This should happen over the course of the next few weeks, and then over the coming years and decades as well. Do not close off your individual memories into a person, personal circle of imperviousness. Rather, welcome the influence of the spiral of storytelling, which will make this experience even more meaningful for you with the passage of time. And so, while I have to remind myself once again that you likely do go on to remember almost nothing of what I just said, I can only hope that you remember that today I tried to say something about the importance of memory. And for those of you who may have simply conked out from somewhere after I mentioned the word iPhone in my first paragraph, I'll begin to draw to a close with a much more straightforward symbol to which you might claim, that of my precious turtle. Mercifully, I will get to its point quickly. Turtles actually got me into college. My college essay was about being forced to do community service at a Massachusetts Audubon chapter that was in the business of tagging diamondback terrapins on the shores of Cape Cod. And while I thought turtles were somewhat endearing in their own plotting sort of way, the essay was about being forced to work with a group of people with whom I had many assumptions, nature lovers, hippies perhaps, burnouts, some version of that. I came to realize that as I stood there on August afternoons, perched on a saltwater marsh canoe, jousting with my rather futile net on a quest for feisty underwater turtles, I had an awful lot to learn about myself and about others. So for me, the turtle has always been less about slow and steady wins the race, but rather a reminder to avoid making assumptions about other people. However, a good friend of mine who happens to be a ham at a neighboring school had a trustee president who spoke about turtles recently at a graduation, believe it or not. His expression of why turtles actually matter was probably more compelling than mine. And I now think of it each time I look at one of my turtle figurines, coffee mugs, or pictures that have been crafted by my young daughters. Put simply, the turtle may be the only animal we know of that quite literally has to stick its neck out if it hopes to get anywhere. Perhaps that image will be the most valuable memory I can share with you today. As my time at your podium truly begins to wane, I fully admit the limitations of your head of school by returning to Julian Barnes once again, as he says, the advice of the old is like the winter sun. It sheds light, but does not warm us. Yet I can still hope that some glimmer of warmth has made it into each of your souls for our conversation today. If I have not been successful in this regard, I can assure you that your class has been successful in having such an impact upon this community. You have also had this impact upon me. My final nod to Nabokov speaks to you from the entire faculty and staff of Berwick Academy. As he says, I think it's all a matter of love. The more you love a memory, the stronger and stranger it is. Without question, the memory of the class of 2012 is one that we will love. For my part, I plan to polish and steward this memory with every future meeting, every cherished story, and every shared connection that we may enjoy in the future. My harbored hope in this memory growing over time is that it might begin to mitigate the more immediate feelings of loss and sadness that are intertwined in my trying to say goodbye at this very moment on your graduation stage. Thank you for all that you have given us, class of 2012, and I wish you nothing but great memories.
salutatorian for the class of 2012, who approaches this podium with an academic record that represents a combination of superior intellectual prowess and academic grit. Her cumulative average sits at 96.13, which includes successful completion of 11 honors and AP courses. This scholar has gone about her work on the hilltop with a quiet determination, and the results have certainly spoken for themselves. A winner of multiple faculty recognition awards, the RPI Math and Science Award, a member of the Cum Laude Society, she is someone who has distinguished herself not only as an intellectual, but as a woman with a passion for math and science in particular. She's given back to our community as a tour guide, active service volunteer, set designer, math team member, and peer tutor. Athletically, she's been a critical contributor on our girls' varsity tennis team all four years. And off the hilltop, she has become a nationally recognized equestrian competitor, and she's successfully managed a rigorous competition schedule with remarkable academic success. It may take a bit of time for Georgetown University to understand and appreciate her in the way we do here. Her quiet and unassuming demeanor makes masks an intellectual force that we reckon buoyed by a type of work ethic that this head of school has admired deeply from afar. Please join me in welcoming the salutatorian for the class of 2012, Ms. Devin Wood.
Although there are no family photos in the halls of Fog Memorial, it is a place for comfort for all of us, where we can relax with friends in the pit, find quiet space to study on the third floor, or catch up with teachers in the many classrooms. No matter where we go, the hilltop constantly reminds us that we are at home. However, you can't have a home without a family. And that is exactly what we have become in the Berwick class of 2012. Of course, we have had our triumphs and our struggles, and the small size of our class has been both a challenge and a blessing. But I think that the family we have formed as a class has been the greatest gift of all. Freshman year, we were a group of individuals thrown together on a canoeing trip, unsure of ourselves and each other. Yet slowly but surely, we did find ourselves in each other. As we have matured into confident classmates and leaders, we truly have become the glue that holds each other together. No one else can do that better than we can. It is this support for one another that has gotten us through these years. And like any family, we didn't always have to like each other, but we did and always will love each other. And throughout all of this, our experiences together have taught us so much. Like that we are the best class at tug of war, that waiting to study until the weekend before exams does actually work, and that it is the rich diversity of our class that pulls us together. We are an extremely funny, athletic, witty, smart, creative, musical, geeky, and well-rounded class. And I know that we have come to be greatly respected and respect each other for these qualities. Whether we are best friends or people who smile in the halls, I believe we have each shared a bonding moment with each other. And that is what family is all about. Our Berwick family extends far beyond the class of 2012 though. And the most important members of this extended family are our faculty. Over 13 years, they have provided us with guidance and support far beyond what was ever expected, becoming our parents away from our individual homes. Of course, they have been amazing teachers, sharing their knowledge with us in ways that sparked new interests and pushed us to be the best versions of ourselves. But they were also family, developing even stronger relationships with us outside of the classroom as advisors, coaches, and friends. And over the years, they read countless college essays, cheered us on at sporting events, and simply listened when we needed someone to talk to, guiding us reassuringly the entire way. That is not to say we are, we're always appreciative of the faculty support, for there were certainly times when they drove us to utter frustration. But now we can thank them for pushing us harder than we thought was possible. Like family, they taught us so much more than the material we needed to graduate. For Mr. Mansfield and Mr. Cornwell, how to drop an egg from a third floor balcony. For Mr. Su Sullivan, how to belittle our technological gizmos. For Ms. Onkin, how to make a board game based off of a famous novel. And even for Mr. Saliba, how to stylishly always remember, thanks to the passion and support of our teachers, who have given Berwick such a strong sense of family. We will miss them dearly next year. And finally, we have one last member of our home and our family at Berwick, whose presence in our lives will continue long after this graduation, our parents. Although they don't spend 45 hours a week on campus like we do, they have been a vital part of our time on the hilltop. For it is they who have made this incredible home we have here possible. I think I can speak for many of my peers when I say, Dad, I can't thank you enough for all you have provided me, especially these phenomenal years at Berwick. Your support, understanding, and commitment 
have been absolutely essential. I couldn't have come this far without you. And to all of the parents here today, I'm sure it hasn't been easy raising teenagers who like to stay out late and always think they're right. But you have done an extraordinary job because this is a sensational group of young men and women. I couldn't have asked for a better experience here at Berwick Academy, despite that shaky first day in kindergarten. My story is only one of many, but I know that each one of us has been so fortunate to call the Hilltop home. From the campus to our classmates, the student body and our teachers, we have developed wonderful relationships and made lasting memories here, our home. Our previous headmaster, Mr. Ridgeway, used to visit our kindergarten classroom with his guitar and sing with us. The lyrics of a song I remember particularly well in advisor role engenders a special bond between two adults and the class as a whole. As they serve as the logistical and spiritual leaders for the group as it makes its way through the four years of our upper school program. The two class advisors this year are an accomplished pair in their own right and their connection to the class of 2012 runs very deep. Kyle Ridgway is an upper school Spanish teacher who's also been a superior coach in our soccer, hockey, and lacrosse programs. Just this year, she was named EIL Coach of the Year for her work in girls lacrosse. Peter Lassie is an upper school history teacher who coaches boys soccer and lacrosse, and he's been known to blow a mean harmonica on stage periodically as well. Peter's been selected this summer to be a member of the first group of Asani Leeds, which is an independent school, the Independent School Association of Northern New England's new program intended to build future leaders within independent schools. Both of these fine people have been chosen to become grade deans next year in recognition of their remarkable work with students at Berwick. Kyle becomes our dean in grade 10, and Peter becomes the dean of grade 11. The class advisors for 2012 will announce the extraordinary results of our senior gift campaign this year. Please welcome Kyle Ridgway and Peter Lassie. pleasure to announce the results of the 2011-2012 Senior Gift Campaign on behalf of the class of 2012. Each year, Berwick Academy asks seniors and their parents to offer a gift to the school in honor of their graduation. The families of the class of 2012 have always been strong supporters of the Academy, so it is no surprise to learn of the incredible results today. That said, the results are inspiring and humbling. 100% of the graduates today made a contribution to the senior gift and did so faster than any other class in recent memory. This shows this remarkable class's commitment to the Academy and through their generosity as well as the participation of over 70 percent of the parents the class of 2012 this year raised almost ninety thousand dollars. This contribution will support the Berwick Academy annual fund in the areas of financial aid and faculty professional development in recognition of these two programs that have special meaning for these graduates. 
on behalf of the school, I would also like to thank the parents of, the, of these graduates, as well as the senior gift chairs for their success. Paula Reed, Sheila Woolley, Mark Tang, and Mary Reinhardt, thank you. This is yet another remarkable accomplishment for the remarkable class, and it has been our distinct pleasure to be your faculty advisors for the past four years. Thank you. recognizes a faculty or staff member who lives his or her commitment to the Academy each day. These qualities reflect the optimism and joy that is exuded by the beloved Jimmy D even to this day. Faculty and staff members are nominated and chosen by the administration. Many people, myself included, sometimes wonder whether the qualities of joy and optimism can be taught and learned. Most of us would probably agree that Jimmy Dean was simply born to see his glass as half full, and every day is a new opportunity. Some of us have to work a bit harder against our Eeyore-like tendencies of worry and concern. Well, I can't say I've known our recipient long enough nor well enough to speak to the level of happiness embedded in his DNA. The administrative team was in wide agreement that his level of optimism, positive energy, and love of this academy has grown exponentially in the past five years. This starts in the classroom, where we have marveled as he's reinvented himself each year. First, this had to do with technology, as he found ways to make the world of his science classes come alive with a new level of data collection and insight through the introduction of probes, sensors, and many other bells and whistles I can't even begin to explain. Then it became a new forensics class, fully enrolled in its first year, that's included crime scenes sprinkled around campus in unexpected places. Most recently, he was apparently listening when the administration started talking more thoughtfully about the integration of travel with our curriculum. This led to an incredible launch of a trip to the Galapagos next year, on the heels of his teaching a new trimester course in con conservation. Within 24 hours of announcing the trip, he had 35 confirmed travelers, a long wait list, and a bunch of positioning by faculty members to see who would get to go as a chaperone. And while I think the topic and the trip is compelling, he probably underestimated how much of this is about him and his ability to connect with young people. He is an ambassador to this school in ways that many do not see or understand. Over the past few years, he has willed his beloved girls ice hockey team to the cusp of a New England berth after winning the EIL again this year. During my first year, we were having conversations as to whether or not we could continue to have a program based on numbers. This new sense of institutional pride has not been by accident. He spends countless hours in the rinks throughout New England spreading the word about Berwick Academy. Never inappropriate, nor promising what he can't deliver, he has drawn an important line between the negatives we might associate with the word recruiting and the positives with what we choose to call attracting superior student athletes. If you think that distinction is simply window dressing, you should get to know the girls who have come to, come to this school on our girls ice hockey team in recent years thanks to his work. Their ability to put the puck in the net hails in comparison to their character, sportsmanship, and scholarship. Whether it's been softball, chaperoning, or trips to the outdoors, he's always willing to heed the call when we need it. When I asked him to join the upper school director search committee this year, I told him I needed someone in there who I knew would appreciate making the trains run on time as much as I did. And while some may not have said it when he first joined this community, I think we all agree now that he embodies the ideals of Jimmy Dean in extraordinary ways. He embraces change, is willing to roll up his sleeves with a smile, 
and is a consummate ambassador for all things Berwick Academy. It is with great personal affection that I have the pleasure of presenting today's Jimmy Dean Award to Gray Cornwell. Exceptional classroom performance, commitment to life outside the classroom, a passion for professional development, willingness to change, and a desire to lead seem to be essential parts of this equation. Our recipient today somehow sits at the nexus of all of these polarities, achieving every single one with good humor and a smile. I'll never forget meeting her during my first year when I was working through the entire faculty and staff a marathon of 30-minute introductory meetings. She strolled in as a self-proclaimed self newbie and had no problem shooting from the hip. So this is why I'm here, this is why I love this school, and this is who I think we could become. Immediately I saw an eagerness and clarity of communication that drew me in. From the start, her ability to simply call it as she saw it, coupled with a hyper-organized attention to detail, have made her one of my go-to people on this campus during my tenure. When one walks into her classroom, one cannot help but be struck by a kind of orderly professionalism that instills confidence. When the institution called, she moved fluidly from sixth and seventh grade down to fifth grade, revealing her uncanny ability for student support and empathy. She now serves as a welcoming ambassador to transitioning students in that role. However, when it became clear that she was emerging as a lead candidate for our middle school dean of students position, I was struck by her boldness once again. I don't want to give up any of my teaching, she said. And so she began to work at least one and a half jobs within our middle school, as she still does today, teaching a full load of fifth grade humanities while continuing to manage the role of dean with notable grace. As a leader of student government and other middle school social events, you can find her at the center of anything being planned in Clement Middle School. In her role on our Green Committee, her presence has pushed past the middle school to become pre-K-12 in nature. Earth Day at Berwick did not exist in the way it does five years ago, and I think we have Pat McManus in our recipient today to thank for what it has become. Given her experience with service and the environment at the Island School, perhaps I shouldn't be surprised. But did I mention that somehow amidst all of this, she pulled off receiving a master's degree from Antioch College in education with an emphasis on environmental stewardship? People always say that the best athletes, like Michael Jordan or Wayne Gretzky, make those around them better. And I believe she's one of those teachers that makes us all better through her relentless drive to become the very best she can be. I personally believe many new challenges and opportunities lie ahead for this remarkable young woman, but today we force her to pause for at least one brief moment to reflect upon all that she has accomplished to date. Suffice it to say, we all have a very tough time keeping up with her. Please join me in congratulating our Dorothy Green Teacher of the Year Award winner, Ms. Molly McKay.
each year around Thanksgiving time, I begin waking up in the middle of the night in cold sweats, wondering who our graduation speaker might be. This year, I found myself struggling to sleep as Peter Saliba's head of school search process at Tilton School began to unfold. But as with most things, there's a silver lining to every cloud. And with Peter's departure, I found the ideal commencement speaker. Plus, you needed a warm-up round for next year, don't you think? When I was deciding whether or not to come to Berwick five years ago, one of the realities that gave me the most pause was knowing the academy would be welcoming a new upper school director as well. And while I take no credit for hiring him, I can say that five years later, Peter Saliba was one of the very best reasons to come to Berwick Academy. Having previously served as an assistant head of school at Sage Hill School, as well as a long tenure at Holderness, this was someone who was ready. And as a graduate of Salisbury, Middlebury, and Dartmouth, I knew his big smile couldn't hide a keen intellect as well. There are a number of things of which I'm proud to have accomplished during my brief tenure here. But sending my first administrator off to become a head of school is near the top of the list. I hope there will be more. While it's always difficult to lose someone of superior talent and school and skill, this sadness is replaced by the knowledge that Berwick has done its part to make the community of independent schools stronger. More selfishly, I now have someone who can officially move from the category of employee to the category of the upper school has grown from 250 to nearly 300 students during his tenure. Beyond the honor committee and student government, club life was fairly dormant on the hilltop before he came. Now we have a separate publication for upper school clubs in our admissions office. Our college placement continues trending upward. The quality of arts and athletics in the upper school has grown. Our upper school as a whole shows a higher level of attention to detail than it did five years ago. And while Peter can't claim all of those successes as his own, he certainly has been the maestro out in front of the orchestra. Perhaps most importantly for me, Peter's shown himself to be an incredible father and husband. Next year, Berwick loses our archivist, Rachel Saliba, and three amazing students as well, Samantha, Jojo, and young Peter. While we'll never replace Mr. Saliba's bow ties and bizarre hand gestures, we will replace him with the first female upper school director in the Academy's history. And if nothing else, she'll come to us with far more impressive hair. When I think about one word to describe Peter, however, enthusiasm has to be that word. Single-handedly, Mr. Saliba turned JV Girls ice hockey from a dreary requirement into a cult. Peter's love of life is contagious, and this love is shown first and foremost by caring about people. In addition to his students, he's been an advocate and partner for his beloved faculty. I'm quite sure those are the relationships that he will miss the most. Tilton School will be welcoming someone who will bring tremendous optimism, work ethic, and follow-through to their campus. They are lucky to have them in ways they cannot yet fully understand, just as I could not understand five years ago. Please join me in welcoming our commencement speaker today, Mr. Peter Saliba. of 2012, to your family, friends, to Mr. Schneider, Mr. Tay, and my colleagues. It is an honor to be sharing this day with you and a very special treat to be the commencement speaker. Ever since Mr. Schneider invited me to speak with you, I have been looking forward to this day. And it's not because I have anything earth shattering to say. No, I've been waiting for this moment in a way that I think you, the class of 2012, can appreciate. This is because although all of us love our parents, they sometimes drive us nuts. And that is why I think you will connect with this story. When I was in high school, I was a rather unremarkable teenager. My grades were good, but not great. I tried to get elected to student government positions, but I never did. And I was usually a reserve player 
on whichever team I happen to stumble onto. However, in the eyes of my parents, I was the best kid in the school. <laughs> Despite all the evidence to the contrary, my parents tended to act as if I had the highest grades, that I was the student body president, and deserved to start every game. This manifested itself in having both my mother and father be very vocal supporters. And honestly, I think they were just trying to help. And as I sat on the bench, or even when the coach might put me in, I would hear their support. Usually it was positive and not too annoying. However, in my <coughs> eyes as a teenager, nothing was more uncool than having your parents yell from the sidelines. Now, of course, I tried to ignore them the best that I could, but that only made it worse. And I know all of you know what I'm talking about. You see, they caught on to my trying to ignore them, and they started to taunt me even more. Their favorite, their favorite shout was, Hi, kitty boy! As you might imagine, all my friends had a field day with this. They would simply say under their breath as I walked to class, Hi, Petey. It was brutal. And now you think this might end with high school, but no, it continued throughout college and into my adult life. Yes, my parents have been to the Dover Arena to watch the magical girls' JV ice hockey team and shouted from the stands. Well, today is my chance to get even. Hi, Mom and Dad. Wait, wave to everyone. Just let them know who you are. Excellent. Thank you very much. Here's Petey Boy. Of course, at this moment, they're thinking two things. Number one is how they're going to get back at me. That's a little dangerous considering my next career. But now they are also thinking, what the heck is this kid going to say? Well, I'm going to propose three things to think about, and then you can decide if they're going to be useful to you or not. They are three stories about my journey so far. It is true that I wanted to be ahead of school since I was 16. With that in mind, I have made choices to help me on my path. I went to college. I studied things that I enjoyed. I got a job. I worked hard. I made some mistakes, and I also had some victories. And if you look at my career experiences and education, it is possible to assume that it was a carefully choreographed routine that brought me to my goal. And that might be true to a point. However, in looking back, I've realized that many of those traits that define me have not come from the schools that I have attended, the jobs that I've had, or the books that I've read. The greatest lessons have come from the people that I have met along the way. For example, it's no secret that I enjoy dressing up. And what's even more interesting is that none of you have asked me why I enjoy dressing up. You just seem to assume that's the way it is. But there is a story. And it's not because I took some course that extolled the virtues of nice pants, shiny shoes, and snappy bow ties. It is because when you meet someone, you are able to say a single word, they have already made a judgment about you based on what you're wearing. That might be unfair, but it's true. And I learned the lesson of looking good in high school, but it wasn't because my school happened to have a jacket and tie dress code. Going back to my unremarkable teenage years, I attained the same level of achievement 
on the dating scene as I did in my academics and sports career. <laughs> Salisbury is an all-boys school, and the monthly dances with our sister schools was a true highlight. I would go to these dances like everybody else with my L.L. Bean shoes, my faded Levi's blue jeans, and my untucked polo shirt with the popped collar. <laughs> the problem was so did every other boy in the school, all 220 of us. That meant that I simply faded into the background with no hope of even striking up a conversation with a girl. On a whim, a friend of mine named Doug Moeller came up with the idea of wearing a bow tie to the next dance. With nothing to lose, I went along with the idea and the next dance found us in white shirts, white pants, white jackets, and a red bow tie. <laughs> On the way to the dance, my friends were having a field day. They were poking fun at us. I even had the chance to get angry at my parents again because the major taunt was, look at Petey in the bow tie. <laughs> Stepping off that bus was perhaps one of the most brutal things I have ever done. But I have to tell you, it worked. <laughs> Doug and I had more conversations with more girls than the entire previous year. <laughs> Dressing up proved to be a good choice. And that was the beginning for me in recognizing that looking just a bit sharper than what people expect is a good thing. From job interviews to meeting my wife, I had a tie on. I have found great success in being just a little dressier than the occasion calls for. In addition to dressing up, I imagine that most of you observe that I am somewhat enthusiastic about what I do. And like dressing up, there is no high school or college course on enthusiasm. I glean this one on one of my pit stops to becoming an educator, and that was when I was a Domino's pizza delivery driver. Much to the disappointment of my family, I moved to Portland, Oregon after graduation. I pulled into town with a friend on a rainy day with no place to live and no job. Enter my brief career at Domino's. As you might imagine, the hourly pay for this job was pretty low. However, I quickly learned that you can make up with it with tips. And the secret to getting tips as a delivery driver is to be fast, efficient, and cheerful. I can do that. It played on my energetic personality, although I didn't ham it up too much because let's face it, I was wearing the Oso Svelte blue, white, and orange uniform of Domino's driver. While I was a pretty enthusiastic person, it was somehow uncool. I didn't want to be excited about my employer. But this all changed during the seventh inning stretch at a Portland Beavers game. The Beavers were a AAA minor league baseball team and the stadium was just a few blocks from our store. It turned out that the owner of our franchise was a big baseball fan and he cooked up the brilliant idea of having a pizza delivered to the stadium in the seventh inning to rile up the fans. Of course, no one wanted the job from our store and so it was foisted on the junior driver. That was me. The assistant manager handed me the pizza and he said, run into the stadium, wait for the people to see you, and then give it to the fan making the most noise. That's exactly what I did in my fast, efficient, and cheerful way. And I accomplished the feat in seven seconds flat. I had to pull it off quickly because, yes, I felt foolish.
running around in a baseball stadium with a pizza and in the blue, white, and orange uniform. My quick delivery infuriated the owner who cornered me in the parking lot as I was trying to make a quick exit where he dressed me down for spoiling everything. He wanted more running around, more smiling, and more crowd participation. He needed some more enthusiasm from me. I thought, I can do that. So the next game, I ran that pizza up and down the aisles, changing sections, faking the handoff several times until the crowd was in a frenzy. Basically, I was the most enthusiastic Domino's driver in the free world. The fans loved it, and after I made the delivery, the owner gave me a big tip, which made it all worth it. But, even more importantly, I learned to let myself show through, no matter what I was doing. I've taken this lesson to heart, and applied it not only to my subsequent deliveries as a Domino's driver, but also to my future jobs. I certainly intend to do that in the next chapter of my life. My last story is about five words. These five words have their origin with the British government during World War II. During the first half of the war, German forces laid siege to England, which challenged the spirit of its citizens. To boost morale, the government launched a carefully orchestrated propaganda campaign. They came up with three slogans, and the first two were printed up on posters and distributed during the war. Although two and a half million posters were printed up of the third slogan, it was never released. It was never posted in public spaces. This is because it was held in reserve in case of a significant disaster, such as a German invasion. This third slogan was keep calm and carry on. Along my journey, I've had many chances to panic, either through situations I found myself in or through mistakes that I have made. In the first category, I have found myself inside a house on fire. I've almost drowned. I've been in a bad car accident on a sinking ship, and I've lost friends, family, and students to illness and tragedy. In the latter category, I've been fired from jobs. I've single-handedly dismasted a 30-foot sailboat, and I've made a mistake in calculating final grades for an entire school. Not this school. <laughs> and I've even said some unsavory things that were captured in print. In some of these situations, most of what happened before my arrival at Berwick, by the way, I've panicked. When I've done that, things did not work out so well. I've learned again not through a course in panic management, but from the people around me. Panicking doesn't help you very much. It's much better to keep your wits about you, ask for help from the people that you trust, and plan a way out of the mess that you find yourself in. I've learned this also from watching myself make mistakes. Sometimes you can be your best teacher. From these experiences, I've learned how to keep calm and carry on. On the senior overnight a few weeks ago, I had the chance to spend some time talking with you about what you wanted to hear from your commencement speaker. I hope I have stayed within the spirit of our conversations in sharing a little bit about what I have learned along the way. Of course, I hope that all of you will try to look a little bit sharper, to be yourselves, and to keep your wits about you when the chips are down. Finally, I also hope that you will always recognize the relationships that you formed here at Berwick, that you always treasure each other, and these moments that you've shared, 
Sometimes these moments were broad class experiences, such as a wilderness trip. And sometimes they were as narrow as talking on the way to lunch with a friend. Right now, some of these moments may not seem all that important, but they will. They will in your future as you begin to learn more about the person that you are becoming. I know that I have learned something from all the people I've met along the way, and especially you, the class of 2012. All my years at Berwick have been formative for me on a personal, on a personal and a professional level. But this year was like none other. With the knowledge that I would be leaving, I have tried to learn as much as I could from each and every one of you. As a group and as individuals, you have prepared me to be a head of school. And for that, I will always be indebted to you, the class of 2012. From my heart, I want to thank you for all that you have taught me. And know that as I move to the next chapter in my life, this past year will always be etched in my memory. Thank you so much for allowing me to share this day with you. And good luck and Godspeed to the class of 2012. of the diplomas to our graduates. And so at this time, I will ask President of the Board of Trustees, Mr. Mark Tay, to assist me with this presentation. In keeping with Berwick tradition, we will actually hear the ringing of Fogg Memorial's bell after each name is announced. Another special tradition at Berwick Academy is that we invite any trustees or academy employees who have children in the class of 2012 to come to the stage to award their diploma in person. I'd ask that the two members in the audience in this category would just walk up here a few uh, moments before their son or daughter arrives. We'll help you up onto the stage and make sure uh, that you have that opportunity. So with that, I will turn to uh, the class advisors to bring our first row of graduates to be presented. Lindsay, Jen 
Jensen, Bratton. Elizabeth Lee Chilton. Michael Sean Claire Jr. Simon David Corson. Yeah! <laughs> Catherine K. Davis. Margaret DePascali. <laughs> Thomas James Dolan. Elizabeth Ann Duchesne. <laughs> Shannon Ray Farrell. Stephen Garabedian. <laughs> Matthew Gratian. Winchester Roman. <laughs> Winfield Charles Hahn. Craig Alden Holmes. Woo! Craigie! Woo! Good boy! Yeah, Craigie! Craigie Holmes. <laughs> Alex Scott Hoyt. Emily Kristen Teach.
Michael Joseph Keith. <laughs> Atik Mahabab Khan. Justin Cortland Hopstein. Joseph Stephen. 
Stevenson, Reed.
Trainer. Tyler David Webster. reception about the ways in which her volunteerism at the Historical Society have made the past come alive before her. Today we recognize her as a living part of Berwick Academy's history as she's left an academic mark that's second to none. While we are sorry to see her go, we take heart in knowing that she'll continue her studies at nearby Col Colby College. Please join me in welcoming the valedictorian and Cogswell Award winner for the class of 2012, Ms. Erin Trainer.
To Mr. Schneider, thank you for your leadership and your example. To Mr. Saliba, thank you for helping to make the upper school what it is today. We cannot imagine Berwick without you, and we wish you success in your future endeavors. To the Board of Trustees, thank you for your support. To our teachers, thank you for your guidance. And to our friends, families, and parents, thank you for your love and patience. I first set foot on Berwick's beautiful campus as a shy eighth grader. Walking the grounds with my mother one Sunday morning, I was overwhelmed by the prospect of attending what felt more like a college than a high school. Standing in the center of the quad, I was dwarfed by my surroundings. As I turned slowly in a circle, I took in the beauty of Jefferson, the library, Early Davidson, 1791, and Whipple. When my gaze landed on fog, its golden bell tower glistening in the distance, I paused. A sense of calm and quiet strength came over me and I took in the, the building's beautiful exterior with fascination. I felt as though I was looking at an old friend, and at that moment, I wanted nothing more than to hear the story it had to tell. My classmates and I have spent the past four years of our lives not only learning that story, but becoming a part of it. We have taken classes in literature, history, language, and math in Bob's classrooms, studied in its quiet corners and hallways, relaxed and come to know one another on its ground floor, even added our signatures to the aging walls of its bell tower. As we have grown and matured in Bob's comforting embrace, it has remained a silent matriarch, whose stained glass eyes have overseen our collective activities with patience, persistence, and pride. It has challenged us, cared for us, and most importantly, it has shown us that with a strong foundation, you can stand the test of time. We have each created a solid foundation while at Berwick, layered with knowledge, ideas, experiences, and memories. Just as fog was constructed from foundation to rooftop, over time, with a variety of materials by many hands, we will go on to build on our foundations. Like us, the structures we create will be unique, and like fog, they will all be sturdy. This promise of resilience inspired me to write a poem that I would like to share with you today. It is entitled, Fog. Percheron pulls against the traces. Granite corner, earth embraces. Deep within this overlook, tradition born above the brook. As Glacier carved the valley low, she planned a spot for you to know. A spot, a moment, frozen time. Others by 
by surprise. And all will leave you with a story to tell, a lesson learned, or a laugh to share. Treasure these gifts and celebrate your progress with every stone you set, window you gaze through, and paint stroke you apply. Berwick Academy Class of 2012, I am sure that each of you will be a competent life designer based on your own definition of success. For some of you, that will mean fulfilling your dream of performing in Madison Square Garden or the Sydney Opera House. For others, it will mean helping children in an elementary school to learn their multiplication tables. As we begin to discover what these definitions are, I hope we will all keep these words, written by Ralph Waldo Emerson, in mind. Success. To laugh often and much. To win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children. To earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends. Appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a little better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition. To know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived. This is to have succeeded. No matter how you define success and design your lives, I know you will build in beauty, character, excellence, and joy. It's in the work that you will find yourselves. It's in the details that you will refine yourselves. Congratulations, class of 2012. I am so thankful to have had the opportunity to share this time with you, and I wish you all the very best. Before we conclude with our benediction and recessional, I'd like to remind our graduates and guests that there will be refreshments available down in the commons immediately following these exercises. But I also want to note a final Berwick Academy tradition before we depart. After the benediction, our faculty will march first to form a tunnel at the edge of the seats through which the graduates will pass. The graduates will in turn form their own receiving line out in front of Jackson Library once they pass through the faculty. Berwick faculty and staff then proceed through the senior receiving line to say a final word of personal congratulations and farewell. We ask the audience to please kindly respect this cherished tradition, and then we invite all who are interested to proceed through the graduate, to, to proceed through the graduate receiving line as well. Then we will move to the commons for some refreshments. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite us all to rise for our final benediction, which will be presented by Reverend Rogers.